You're rolling? What happened on 9-11 is a phony, you know, and we've never learned the truth about 9-11. The whole agenda is to create a one-world government where everybody has an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be in those chips. And this is getting me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. Aaron, what do you think Women's Liberation was about? We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib. They do whatever they want to do. What we want doesn't matter anymore. It's their agenda, it's their plans that matter. They have all the money they want. They can make all the money they want. They, they have a machine that can make all the money. <laughs> it's not about money. It's about control. It's about their vision of how they want to see the world. You hear George Bush saying democracy means freedom. No, democracy equals new world order. I believe God put me on this earth to be the best person I could be and put everybody on this earth to be the best they can be. You have to stand up for what's right in life. And unless you do that, you're nothing. Award-winning filmmaker turned freedom fighter, Aaron Russo was an amazing individual. You know, he'd been battling cancer for more than three and a half years when he began making America Freedom to Fascism that he shot, directed, edited pretty much on his own with just the help of a few people. An amazing individual. A long life of award-winning films, of hard work, and for standing up for the Bill of Rights and Constitution. You know, when we first went and shot this interview, I put it on the web for free. Uh, but parts of it have never been seen. So here today, you're going to have a chance to see the in-depth interview, the final interview with Aaron Russo. But his important work lives on. You know, he made one of the definitive films exposing the elite that control this nation and the world, the private Federal Reserve. And the information he put out two years ago rings more true today than ever. And uh, his film, America, Freedom to Fascism, and Mad as Hell, and the other great works he did just continue like ripples in a pond uh, to light bushfires in the minds of men and women everywhere. So this film is dedicated to the one, the only, Aaron Russo. You rolling? I'm honored to be interviewed by Alex Jones, a truth seeker, fighting for justice in America. Now he's charming me. He's getting me all smiling. <laughs> Aaron, when did you start to think something was wrong in the world or start to find out about the whole banking cartel and the Federal Reserve System for the new world order? Well, that, that was a, a progression of events. Uh, I became very, I'm, I've always been a very independent person, always believed in individuality, and that we were put on this earth to be uh, unique individuals to fulfill our God-given potential, and that uh, the only way to fulfill your potential is to be free, to find out who you are, and to make your errors, to make mistakes. And as I, as, uh, I grew up, I began to realize more and more the government was inhibiting me in things that I wanted to do. And uh, what happened, uh, I was very successful in the ladies' lingerie business. I worked for my dad. He had a small undergarment business. And I created the first ladies' bikini panties back in 1963, actually. And then I opened up a, um, a nightclub in Chicago called the Electric Theater. Uh, that, that opened up the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. All right, and so the city of Chicago was in flames the day my club opened, and nobody came out to the club. And um, well, what happened was that um, uh, that was the year the Democratic Convention in Chicago in '68, and so my club became a hangout for the hippies, you know, and because they, they wanted to go to Chicago and protest what was going on. And I was having a concert at my club one night to raise money. And uh, the police uh, raided the nightclub, my club for no reason at all. And uh, I was standing outside my, in my office looking, overlooking the street, and I saw all these paddy wagons pulling up in front of my club. And I was a 24-year-old kid. You know, I had no experience at all, really. So what are these paddy wagons doing here? And then I saw all these cops getting out of the paddy wagons coming into my club. I said, oh, my God, they're raiding me. And so uh, I ran down to the stage, and I got on the stage, and I stopped the band from playing. And I said to the people in the audience, we're being raided, you know, so uh, sit down on the floor, cooperate, you know, you know, and uh, uh, plot your identification, and cooperate with the police. And as I said that, 
uh, two of the cops from behind threw me onto the floor and grabbed me and, and started dragging me out of the club. Uh, and uh, I'm going, you know, victory, victory, you know, I'm playing it for it was worth at the time. I was a kid. And, uh, uh, and then I saw the fire department there. And the fire department was dumping garbage cans, the garbage all over the floor. And I thought to myself, well, why are they doing that? You know, very quickly as, I was dra- as they were dragging me out. And I didn't quite understand it. So they threw me into the paddy wagon. As I got into the paddy wagon, one of the cops grabbed my testicles from behind and squeezed. And I went into the paddy wagon in gigantic pain. And uh, the next person that came into the paddy wagon, the cop, as he was stepping in, the cops took the billy club, smashed him on the head with it, and just split his skull, you know, for no reason. I mean, there was nothing wrong. That was kind of your awakening. That was my awakening. It's like, what is going on? I thought this was America. So I, I initially waved it on Chicago and Mayor Daly. Think it was just it was, it was Chicago. And anyway, I went on the I went. It was the headlines of the newspapers the next day. You know, there was my picture in the newspapers. The headlines: Electric Theater short circuited. It was raided. And in the article, uh, they went ahead and they said that uh, the reason they raided the club was because the fire department came there and saw it was messy, full of garbage, and the hippies started attacking them, which was totally not true. Those yeah. dirty hippies? It was, yeah, it was totally false. You know, it was, it was a complete fabrication. So they ran a false flag on you. They yeah. you. Yeah, they, of course. You know, and uh, I was in shock. I said, people lie like that? People actually do these things? I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, it was an awakening to me. And I went on television, I told people on television that they lied. Nobody cared. Nobody cared what the truth was. You know, it was shocking to me. Um, and then a, 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 week or, a week or two weeks later, I forget exactly what it was, uh, two, two cops come to see me, a lieutenant and a, and a sergeant, a captain and a sergeant. And they said, Mr. Russo, we're sorry if you got hurt that night at the club and the raid, but... Uh, we're here to tell you that if you want to keep the club open, it's going to take uh, $2,000 a month, and we're going to come see you once a month, and whenever we have to raid you, we're going to call you, you know, and we'll let you know we're going to come in tonight and raid you. This was mafia. Uh-huh. Well, the police mafia, yeah. you know. And uh, actually, it was actually actually more interesting than that. They said, listen, there's the A plan, there's the B plan, and there's the super deluxe plan. And this one, of course, each one, of course, that much money a month. Which one do you want? What was the super deluxe? That's the one I took. That was a two thousand a month plan, and I took that plan and um, I paid them two thousand dollars a month, and they left me alone. And whenever they were going to raid the club, they would come there. We're going to raid. We're going to have a phony raid tonight, you know, just to look good for the people in the neighborhood, you know. So that was your first big education. That was my education into corruption in government, you know. But I really thought that was basically Chicago. I didn't realize it was the whole country was like that. And so that was my wake-up call, that people lie and cheat and steal. And uh, I thought everybody was always honest and nice and decent. And uh, I had no idea about any of these things. Well, what happened with me was that they finally one day they came to me and they said, look, we, we, we can't take your money anymore. I said, why, what's up? What's going on? I said, we have to close your club. There's elections coming. And the alderman and the neighbor don't want you open anymore. So we can't take your money. So I had to go to court and fight them, and they were trying to close the club. And then one night there was a fire, and the club never reopened again. It was, they, the club just closed, and that was the end of the club. And they, they, they burned me down, and that, that was the end of my experience. And then I moved back to New York, where I met Bette Midler, and uh, I uh, ran into her at a little uh, nightclub she was playing called The Improv, and I thought she was fabulous. And through a series of events, I began managing her. And as soon as I started managing her, her career took off like a rocket, you know, just fort- fortuitous, I guess. And um, uh, we became very, very successful. And through managing Bet, I started producing shows on Broadway where I won the Tony, and I produced a television show where I won the Emmy with Dustin Hoffman and Bet, you know. And then uh, I produced The Rose for her, where she got Academy Award nominations. And then that led me to producing Trading Places, which everybody knows. You know, I think it's the best Eddie Murphy movie. Well, it's a good one. I don't know if it's the best, but it's a really good one. And I'm very proud I made that movie. And so in, in my mind, um, I feel as if I've made a classic comedy in Trading Places. 
a classic musical in The Rose, and a classic documentary in Freedom to Fascism. You know, so I'm very proud of my work that I've done as a filmmaker. Aaron, why do you do this? What's the philosophy of your life? What do you think life's all about? I think the importance of life is to like yourself. If you don't like yourself, nothing means anything. To like yourself means you have to respect yourself. To respect yourself means you have to take actions that you respect if somebody else did them. And what's the point of living if you don't like who you are? You can have all the money in the world, and if you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see there, what's the point of it? So I, to me, the most important thing is that I like who I am, and that I take actions that I would respect if somebody else did them. That you live a life of character, honesty, truthfulness, and I believe that a person has the ability to mold their character like a sculptor can mold a piece of clay. You know, there's no saying that a leopard never changed in spots. I don't believe that. I believe people have the total ability to mold their character into what they choose to be in their life, what their ideals are. And that's what I try to do with my life. I am not the same person today I was as I was 30 years ago. I've changed a lot because I wanted to be something better than what I was before. And my philosophy is that you have to like yourself, you have to be a decent person with character and integrity and honor. And that's what's important. Back in... Uh in the late 80s, I was a pretty big silver trader and gold trader. And uh, I don't think I've ever told this story on tape before. Uh, I was a pretty big silver and gold trader. And um, the, uh, I took, and I always paid my taxes, and I took what was a legal tax deduction on my silver trades. And uh, a few years later, I think it was 88 or 89 or something, the uh, IRS claimed that what I did, and other people did as well, was now illegal. We couldn't do it anymore. But they made it retroactive. I said, what do you mean retroactive? It was legal then. We did, I did what was legal. I said, yeah, but it's now we're making it illegal retroactively. And you, it, that's not good. So you owe us six hundred dollars or $800,000. For what? It was legal. How could you make something retroactive? Change the law backwards in time. It makes no sense. Well, we're doing it. And so everybody said they can't do that, so we went to court, a class action lawsuit. And the judge agreed with the IRS and said they could do it retroactively. And that's when I knew that there was something wrong in America with the IRS and the system here. You know, Aaron, you were telling me this story last night. Uh, and... Before you even finish saying, in the late 80s, the tax law, I said retroactive. And I knew that because they literally ruined my dad, but, but he paid. He, he didn't know. He still thought this was America. And uh, it, it was legal tax law, what you're supposed to do. They said retroactively you owe, and with, not just retroactive, but they said you also have penalties and interest. That's right. So how do you have penalties and interest on something when they retroactively change the law? Well, first of all, you can't retroactively be, how can you, how can you do anything retroactively? Penalties and interest are a farce. The whole thing, because they do whatever they want to do. And that's when I realized America is not America. It's not the land that I was taught it was. Because they can do whatever they wish to do. And there's nothing the citizen can do about it. Now, you've made America Freedom to Fascism. I want to walk through that film, and I want to encourage everybody out there to, to uh, get a copy of it on DVD. It was also in theaters around the country. And the, I think the best film out there on the Federal Reserve and the IRS and the whole banker scam, and I want to discuss that with you here, uh, but I wanted to uh, go back a little bit uh, to the point that we discussed uh, last night, where you don't advise people to not pay, and I do the same thing. People say, well, wait, you're saying it's a scam, but you're saying go ahead and pay it, and I like the way you summed it up. Well, it's really fairly simple. I mean, uh, since making that movie... You know, many people come to me and ask me whether they should pay their income taxes or not, you know, and I never advise people not to pay. And the reason I, I tell them, I say, look, I've done a lot of research. There isn't, the Supreme Court has ruled that the IRS has no authority. The 16th Amendment did not give the IRS the authority to tax your labor and your wages. That's a fact, all right? The Supreme Court is the law of the land, you know, and, and, the, and the IRS does not trump the Supreme Court. However, that being the case... The fact is, if the mafia would come to you and say, we want $2,000 a month that we're going to hurt you, I would not advise you not to pay them, because you may get hurt by not paying them. Whether it's legal or not, doesn't necessarily matter. You're going to get hurt if you don't. It's the same thing with the IRS. 
They can hurt you. They can put you in jail. They can torture you. So if you don't pay them, you may get hurt. So I never advise people not to pay. You know, I tell people, yeah, pay your taxes. Look what happened to but, Congressman Hansen. Yeah, Congressman Hansen's a great example. Pay your taxes. But you know what? Shut down the Federal Reserve System, and eventually you won't have to pay those taxes anymore. See, the, the, the IRS is a symptom of the problem. The real problem the, is the banking industry and the bankers in this country. That's where the real problem lies. That's the root of our problem. That's why we've lost America, okay? So, yeah, pay your taxes, because if you don't pay them, you might get hurt. And I've heard all the arguments, you know, uh, how, what tax protesters say and so on and so forth. And I don't call them tax protesters. I call them the tax honesty movement, because they're being honest, you know, at least. But the fact of the matter is you, you're being forced, you're being compelled to pay it because you're facing jail sentences, you're facing time, you're facing corruption of the courts if you don't pay, right? And so you pay it, because you just like you pay the mafia. But with the mafia, at least you have the government to call and try and help you to get past the mafia, to protect you. Here you have nobody to protect you. The, the, the American people are living in a matrix. They don't understand the truth of how things are working in this country. You know, and let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The very fact is that if you, if you ask 100 people on the street, what kind of government is America supposed to be? 99% of them will tell you a democracy. America is supposed to be a democracy. But that's a lie. That's an illusion. The word democracy is not written into the Constitution at one time. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. The Founding Fathers hated the idea of a democracy. They thought it was the worst form of government there is. And I agree with them. Because in a democracy, 51% of the people control 49% of the people. If you're part of the 49%, you're not free. America was founded as a constitutional republic. And in that constitutional republic that we have, 99% of the people can't take away the rights of 1%. You have your rights because you were born with them. You have God-given human rights that nobody can take away from you. The government, the majority, no matter who they are, I can't take away your rights. And that's what, that's, that's what our founding fathers gave us. But the psychological operations that they, they do to us, they make us believe that we're a democracy and that majority rules. You see? And they want you to believe that. Because then they tell you, this poll says, this many want this, and this many want that, and this many want this. And it doesn't have anything to do with anything. Well, Hitler was elected. Hitler was elected. Hitler did everything legally. And in a re constitutional republic, a minority is, pro is protected against a majority. Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin, to paraphrase, that said, democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner? Exactly. And then he also said, in a republic, the sheep would have a gun. <laughs> <laughs> to protect himself, you know, and that's, that's, that's the truth. America is not a democracy, but you ask the most intelligent people what form of government America is supposed to be, they'll say democracy. Because that's, that's what they've been brainwashed. They've been psyoped into believing that. They believe that we're in Iraq. They believe we're in Iraq to promote democracy. The word democracy, you hear George Bush saying democracy means freedom. No. Democracy equals new world order. Democracy equals slavery. The word democracy is not synonymous with freedom. It's the opposite of freedom. Democracy is the worst form of government you can have because it's majority rule. And the government can tell you exactly what they want to tell you to do. Because the majority wants it. I don't care what the majority wants. I live my life as I choose. And if I don't commit violence, theft, or fraud against another human being, I can live my life as I wish. That's my choice. And if I'm allowed to make mistakes, because when you make mistakes, you learn from them. You grow as a human being. We're put on this earth to become the best individuals we can be, to fulfill our God-given potential. Right? We're not here to put on this earth so that the government can tell us how to live our lives and what we must do. We put into these systems and these paradigms. No. The same thing in health. You know, if you're sick, you have to have a certain protocol. Nonsense. You know, be individuals. Think for yourself. Have critical thinking, you know. And so what's happened is that because they've taught everybody that we're a democracy, which is not true, now, so then in 1913, they bring the Federal Reserve System into being, right? And now you have this Federal Reserve System, which then in 1913 got the right to create money for the government, when before that, the government created its own money. 
Now, now the government, when it needed money, had to borrow it from this private bank called the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank owned by individuals, incorporated in Delaware. And so um, what happens is now the government borrows money from them to fund the government. Then the government says, well, we have to pay these people interest. How are we going to pay them interest? Let's impose a tax on the labor of the American people, which never existed before, to pay the interest to the bankers. In fact, in 1980, Ronald Reagan said not one red cent uh, of your income tax money goes to run the country. It all goes to the Federal Reserve. Well, it, go, what, it was the Grace Commission report that said that uh, all the, not one nickel goes to the infrastructure of the country. You know, uh, I guess Reagan quoted that. Then, right. So. And so, um, but the point, the, point I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that by creating this Federal Reserve system, the government now became dependent on these private banks for money. And they started take, taxing us, you see. And so now, now what happens is that um, in 35, I believe it was, Social Security started. And they gave Social Security cards, said not to be used for identification, the Social Security number right on the card, right? And through Social Security, they started deducting money out of your, out of your paycheck. That was the first time they were ever take, could take money out of your paycheck because people agreed to it because they thought it was going to their retirement fund. And so then when they instituted the income tax again, they started taking money out of your paycheck because Social Security could do it. So then, then they could do it again. You see what I'm saying? And so now they've even taken control of the tax, the, the tax payment itself. I mean, we're really like you're a slave. They're right. taking it right there when you make it. Exactly. They don't even trust the public enough to, to go send them a check. Themselves. Yeah. Right. So they take it out automatically because they know people aren't going to want to pay it. So what's happened is that through the implementation of the Federal Reserve System, the government has become uh, vested in these bankers, and they get their money from the bankers. And so then they impose a tax on us, which makes us more slaves, makes it more difficult for us to survive, right, giving them more profits. And now what's happened is that uh, through the, the, the Federal Reserve System, the bankers have pretty much taken control of our government. It doesn't matter Republican and Democrat anymore because they're both the same. Neither one of them are talking about shutting down the Federal Reserve System or stopping the payment of taxes, you know, uh, or any of the big issues that face Americans, right? So uh, I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, okay, who was one of the Rockefeller family, and he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney, and uh, we became friends. We started talking about things, and... Um, I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish. And the goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over the, Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks. And they're, and they're all part of the Communist Manifesto. You know, central banking is one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talk about America being a capitalistic country, but yet at the same time we have a central bank that plans everything for us, right? And the graduated income tax is another plank of the Communist Manifesto, right? So right there you have two major planks of the Communist Manifesto that have been brought in because of the Federal Reserve System, okay? So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one-world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers. Where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union, right? And they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the, whole, the, the whole agenda is to create a one-world government where everybody has an, R R an RFID chip implanted in them, all money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, anytime you have money in your, in your, in your chip, 
they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do. What everything. You sell. Everything is in there. You know? And so they, they want a one world government controlled by them. Everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people, and you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. More than a decade ago, I began getting secret government documents, and we published them, where the feds were training uh, the local police uh, and the military that gun owners, conservatives, people that made frequent references to the U.S. Constitution were terrorists. That's a quote. But in 2009, it broke into the national media when we received uh, the secret MIAC report from a state police officer, um, and that was in the state of Missouri, but the feds had written it, demonizing Ron Paul, people that wanted to end the Federal Reserve, people that wanted liberty and freedom. And now more secret reports have been released, like the Department of Homeland Security report, which the feds admit they wrote, that says returning veterans are the number one terror threat in America, that gun owners uh, are part of that number one threat, that people buying ammo are the number one threat. Think about this. You have these private bankers overthrowing the United States, and they're secretly training the police that gun owners and patriots and veterans are the number one threat. So they're saying the American people that follow the Constitution and Bill of Rights that will actually stand up against this tyranny are terrorists because they are the terrorists. They are the criminals coming in with a corporate takeover, a hijacking of the nation. Eric, can you be specific about when you met Rockefeller, how it happened in these discussions? I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew who called me up one day and said uh, one of the Rockefellers would like to meet you. I had made a video called Mad as Hell, and uh, he'd seen the video and wanted to meet me and knew I was running for governor of Nevada. So sure, I'd love to meet him. And I met him, and I liked him, and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man. And uh, we used to talk and share ideas and thoughts. And... Um, He's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event. Never told me what the event was going to be. But there was going to be an event. And out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We were going to invade Iraq, you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East and make it all part of the New World Order. And we go after Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, sure enough, later 9-11 happened. And I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're going to see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places. And, it's, and there's going to be this war on terror, uh, which is no real enemy. And the whole thing is a giant hoax, you know, but it's a way for the government to take over the American people. He told you it was going to be a hoax. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question. He says, there's going to be war on terror. And he's laughing. There's no... <laughs> Who are we fighting? I mean, why do you think 9-11 happened and then nothing's happened since then? Do you think that our security is so great here that these people who pulled off 9-11 who were able to... can't knock down another plane? Come on, it's ridiculous. 9-11 was done by people in our own government and our own banking system to perpetuate the fear of the American people and to subordinating themselves to anything the government wants them to do. That's what it's about, and to create this, war, this endless war on terror. And, that's why we, and that was the first lie. And the next lie was going into Iraq, you know, uh, to uh, get Saddam Hussein out with his weapons of mass destruction. That was the next lie. Now, now, specifically, this was a little over six years ago? This was... Uh, 11 months before 9-11. Yeah. And Nick Rockefeller, he's a lawyer, he is, he, he's become your friend over the previous years, and he's saying to you that there's going to be this big event, and then out of that we're going to have a war on terror, and it's just going to go on and on. Right. An endless war on terror without, without any real enemy. That you can never, so you can never define a winner. And, and uh, did he say that it's going to be perfect because you can't define an enemy? It just goes yeah, on. Yeah, because you can't define a winner. There's no one no one to beat, so it goes on and on forever. And they can do whatever they want. They scare the hell out of the American public. 
Look, this whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. It's very difficult to say it out loud because people are intimidated against saying it. Because if you say it, they want to make you into a nutcase. Let's but, the truth, but the truth has to be, the truth has to come out. That's why I'm doing this interview. The fact of the matter happens to be that the whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. The other is a war going on in Iraq because we invaded Iraq. And people over there fighting, you know. But the war on terror, it's a joke, you know. And until we discover what really happened on 9-11 and who was responsible for 9-11, because that's where the war on terror emanates from. That's where it comes from. It was 9-11 that allowed this war on terror to begin. And until we get to the bottom root of 9-11, the truth of 9-11, we'll never know about the war on terror. Aaron, you said that he was, and I think it's important, and I know this about the Rockefellers from Dr. Dennis Cuddy and many others, who literally, you'll be 20 years old in a lunch line at college, and it was David Rockefeller. And he hears here, I mean, they're experts at recruiting and getting what they call players, and that clearly he was, I mean, I don't want to make it specific and just get you to reiterate what you said last night uh, about you were, you got 30% of the vote, you were having an effect, you, you, you made mad as hell, they knew that you'd started the Constitution Party, yeah. they knew that you were uh, somebody who was taking action and getting things done, he'd already made some big films, had a lot of other successes, right. so they were trying to recruit you, and, and, and didn't it come down to the point of, hey, we are here to recruit you, and don't worry, your chip's going to say, don't mess with us, you know, this guy's, uh, don't touch. Yeah, yes, that did happen, now, I was definitely being recruited. But it's more subtle than that. Well, your words. Just go through the process, and then, and then what he said. Well, well, what it is is, I, we remember, we were friends, and we used to have, he used to come to my house a lot. We'd have dinner, we'd talk, and he'd, he'd tell me about business investments, how you get involved in, you know, or they would help me with this business investment or that business investment. And was I interested in joining the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, I would have to get a letter to join them, but was I interested in that? And, uh, you know, just, uh, just stuff, you know, leading you on. And, and uh, I, I used to say to him that I never really did that because that wasn't where I was coming from. You know, as much as I like you, Nick, you know, your ways and my ways, we're, the, we're on the opposite side of the fence. You know, I don't believe in enslaving people, you know, and... Um, and he would come back with, oh, I do? Well, it would be more like, you it's know... It's better for them, well, it's more like, you know, um, how do I put it? It was like, what do you care about them? What do you care about those people? What difference does it make to you? Take care of your own life. Do the best you can for you and your family. What do the rest of the people mean to you? They don't mean anything to you. They're just serfs. They're just people. You know, it was it was just a lack of caring, you know, and that's just not who I was. It was just it was just sort of like cold, you know, it was just like cold, you know, and uh, I used to say to him, what, what's the point of all this? You have all the money in the world you need, you have all the power you need, what's the point? You know, what's the end goal? And he said the end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society, to have the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor... Controlling the world. What, and, and, and I said, all, do all the people in the Council on Foreign Relations believe this way you do? He said, no, no, no. You know, it, 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 most of them believe they're doing the right thing. A lot of them believe it's better, it's better off being socialistic. You know, we have to convince people that capitalism, that socialism is really capitalism. Because America is becoming a socialist country. It's a communist country today. And here we are, years later, after Aaron Russo points out that this is not a capitalist or free market country but is really socialist. In fact, here's the cover of Newsweek. We are all socialists now. But this isn't the socialism the public thinks it is, where the government robs from the rich to give to the poor. Actually, it's always the big banks, the elites throughout history that fund socialism. They want to use the middle class's money uh, to basically domesticate the working class and expand the size of government so it can basically, in the end game, eradicate the middle class and have a giant submass of uneducated slaves who have no chance of ever rebelling against the tyranny and a tiny elite in control of it all. And that is the very nature of this new world order system. They are using big government to strangle competition, to uh, take control of the people, to break up the family to basically set up a global plantation or neo-feudalist state. 
Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he, well, we were, he was at the house one night, and uh, we, were talking, we were talking, and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want me, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was we couldn't tax half the population before women's lib. And the second reason was now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up their family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's lib, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. You know? Aaron, did you know that Gloria Steinem, in one of her own books, now admits the CIA funded Miss Magazine? No, I had no idea about that. No, I never heard that. Yeah, we're gonna CIA funded Ms. Magazine? Funded Ms. Magazine with the stated goal of taxing women and breaking up the family. No kidding. I never heard that. Well, Nick told me. I mean, I mean, I know it, but not because I know the CIA was involved in it. Well, she, Gloria Steinem was proud of it. Oh, the CIA wanted to help me help women. No and kidding. So they funded it. Yeah, and of course it's divide and conquer. Right, and, of and course. And what they do is they focus in, obviously, on real problems. Women were getting shafted in many ways. But the elite didn't, wasn't planning to help them. They were planning to really shaft them and take men away from them. Look at what they did with black families. You only had about 10% illegitimacy 50 years ago uh, in black communities, and now it's over 90%. And look at welfare. You were going to give me some money, but you can't have a man in the house. Right. And, and so that was further to degrade the family, yeah. totally destroyed, uh, and, and, and now illegitimacy is over 50% in the general right. population. Right. Well, see, the whole thing is, is these people control the money. So they make all the rules, you understand? And, and they put whatever rules they want into effect. And the truth is, America has really become a socialist, communistic country. And nobody, everybody says it's a capitalist country. It's not a capitalist country. You know, how can it be capitalistic when you have a central bank? <laughs> That's the first, you can't, it can't be, you know? The it's money, a planned economy. It's a planned economy. It's, it's, it's a phony. If they want to create prosperity, they just print... Dollars, they just make dollars or put digits into the economy. And, they, and then now you have prosperity. You don't have real prosperity. You don't have real manufacturing. You just have, you just have money being injected in. It's an infusion of credit. Which only being, makes the government go into more debt. Into more debt. Fair Reserve is poison to our country. Of course it is. It's poison. Whoever makes the money makes the rules. Rothschild said that. And they make the money. Why are we allowing these private bankers to make the money for our country? It makes no sense. Why are we paying interest to these banks to make money for us when the government can do it itself without paying interest and without all that debt? There's no answer to that question, and it's the question no politician will raise. Everybody talks about America's debt, how much debt we're in. We're in debt because we have to borrow money. But we don't have to borrow money. They designed it so we go into debt. Exactly. We can create the money and back it by gold so, you have, so they can't create too much of it so you don't have the inflation and, and do what the founding fathers gave us. But instead, the bankers make the money, they control the government, they buy the politicians, they tell us who gets into office, you have computer voting, that's a fraud. They do whatever they want to do to us. They do whatever they want to do to us, and it has to stop. My friendship with Nick Rockefeller was one where we, were, uh, we expressed ideas to each other and thoughts and philosophies, and he wanted me to become part of what they were doing and for me to become a member of the CFR and uh, offered various business opportunities for me to get involved in and for me to um, not take up the fight or the battle that I've been taking up in the past, you know, to drop that idea because what was the point of my fighting for the people? I was a guy who was very successful in the movie business, and I saw the truth of what was happening. I tried to express it to the people, 
And rather than having me express it to the people, they wanted me to join their side because I was a mover and a shaker. And rather than me opposing them, to join them. It was real simple. And uh, he tried to recruit me into that situation. And um, I didn't go for it. Did he get angry when you didn't go for it? No, no. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, I remember one time he said to me, you join us, so you, ha so you have an ID card, Aaron, you know, you have a chip, and your chip will say KMA on it. And uh, I said, what does KMA mean? He said, it means kiss my ass. <laughs> and anybody stops you, a cop or whatever, and you show them your card or your chip, and uh, they'll, they'll not leave you alone because you're one of us. One of the central pillars of tyranny is that the establishment is exempt from the laws that they pass for the rest of us. We saw it in Rome. We saw it with Hitler. We saw Richard Nixon saying, look, I'm the president. If I break the law, it's not illegal. We saw George Bush and Dick Cheney say that. We see Barack Obama continuing that, saying, I'm not going to give detainees real trials. I'm going to give them secret kangaroo military commissions trials, and we're going to uh, hold them in secret camps, and I've got executive privilege. It's the same thing over and over again. And one example of hundreds that are out there was a story back in April of 2008 out of the Orange County Register. And this backs up exactly what Aaron's talking about with Mr. Rockefeller saying, I got a chip in my hand, kiss my ass. Here's just one example of hundreds. Special license plates shield officials from traffic tickets. And it goes on to say that 996,000 plus vehicles in California are exempt from no insurance, reckless driving, speeding, uh, running through toll booths, running red lights, on and on and on. And who is it? It's state employees. It's federal employees that can go and get exempt. Uh, it's police. It's government bureaucrats above the very laws they try to enforce on us. This is tyranny. And so literally all over the nation, they've, they've tried to pass it in Texas but failed. They want it. Uh, where the police are above the law, where the government officials are above the law, where they have immunity, where they can't be prosecuted for crimes. Congress exempts itself for most of the tax laws and other laws that they uh, put on the rest of us. They're exempt from Social Security, and they get a pension that pays out on average five times what citizens get. Again, it's already happening. So the chip in the hand and saying they're above the law under the guise of national security, that's what the 1947 National Security Act and now this whole homeland security system is all about. What, why are you fighting for the people for? What, what is that about? The people are just, you know, the, the, they have to be ruled. They have, they have to be, you know, the, the Constitution, what, we, what you're standing for, is only for a few people. It's only a few individuals that can live that way, you know. And uh, we believe that it's best for society to be ruled by an elite people who uh, control everything. And I said, I don't believe that. You know, I believe God put me on this earth to be the best person I could be and put everybody on this earth to be the best they can be, not to be a slave and a sheep to you and, and these people. And I don't understand why you want to control everything. What is the need for that, you know? And uh, I asked them, do all the people in the Council of Foreign Relations feel the same way you feel? He said, no, a lot of them think they're doing the right thing. They think that socialism is the best way to go. They think that, uh, you know, uh, that they're doing the right thing. But the people at the top, they all know the truth of what's happening. And, and that's what so, it is. So it's compartmentalized within the elite structure as well. Of course it is. Middle. Of course it is. I mean, all the people that, that are in the CFR, was that two, 3,000 people? If you go to, like, Dan Rather, they don't know, they don't know what's going on. They, just, they, they, they join the CFR because it's prestigious. They think it's good for business, it's good for this. You know, they don't know what's really happening. You know, we're, we're, the evil that comes out of it, that's emanating out of it. You know, and uh, to me, you know, uh, the biggest evil is what's happening right now because uh, this, what happened on 9-11 is a phony, you know, and we've never learned the truth about 9-11. That's the question yeah. I wanted to uh, follow up on. He tells you 11 months before there's going to be an event, all this is going to happen. What did you think on the morning of 9-11? Where were you, and did you think about Nick Rockefeller and what he had told you when you saw those towers fall? No, I, I was actually in Tahiti when 9-11 happened, and I got a call from my son. And um, my son said, the Twin Towers, they were just attacked, and they were falling down or something. So what are you talking about? I, I was in Tahiti. I was asleep. And uh, he said, yeah, they were hit by a plane, da da da, da. And so uh, where, I, where I lived, in, where I was in Tahiti... There was no television, so I had to run around the other side of the island 
to a hotel where they had, and it was all on television, you know, and that's when I first saw the stuff on TV about it. And I, I didn't immediately equate it to Nick, you know, but when I realized that we're going to go into Afghanistan, <laughs> Iraq, and as that developed, I realized what it was. How could there be a war on terror and, and, and actually say that we're having a war against terrorism and leave the borders wide open? If you were the President of the United States, or I were the President of the United States, and 9-11 really happened the way they want us to believe it happened, the first thing you would do is shut down the borders so people couldn't get in the country to harm you. But they left the borders wide open because the bankers want the borders open because they want a one-world government. They want, a, they want a North American Union. They don't want borders here. The 9-11 was only a manifestation. It was done to create a fear in the American public, right, so that, that we will obey what they want us to do. And the very first, take Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. Here's a guy who was six foot six, ugly as could be. I heard he smelled, okay? He sits in coach on a plane, lighting matches to put his shoe on fire, surrounded by people. It's idiotic. If you were going to blow up a plane, you go into the bathroom, you close the door, and you put your shoe on fire. You're not going to sit there surrounded by people lighting matches on a no-smoking flight. They want you to believe this nonsense. It's ridiculous. Seven Sevens come out now, and... The majority of the British people think it's an inside job, and all the evidence points towards it being an inside job. Yeah, I mean, I mean what happened in London? Yes. All this is nonsense. It's just keep people in fear. It's this endless war on terrorism that doesn't really exist, so people will be submit to whatever the government wants them to submit to. Searches, check your shoes, have ID cards, put chips in you, you know, where you become servants to the elite. That's what this is all about, you know? Restore America's Republic to what it's supposed to be, get the bankers out of our government, get, change, get, get the bankers out of our government. Government should stop borrowing money from the banks. Government should make its own money, restore the Republic, individual freedoms. That's what this country's about. And until we do that, we're going we're gonna to be slaves. I mean, to me, uh, I, I, see, I, I see people like Bill O'Reilly on television, right? And I see how much they control the media. Like, there's this girl on Bill O'Reilly the other night uh, from an organization saying the world can't wait. And she, this girl was spot on. Everything she was saying was the truth. And all Bill O'Reilly could do was call her a lunatic. He couldn't challenge the facts. They, they just call people names. They can't, and, and until we just find that, look, this world, we're heading into a world of danger, possible nuclear wars, you know, because the banking industry is trying to take over the world. 9-11 is the beginning of the war on terror. That war on terror is leading us into Iraq, which is the next lie. So you had the lie of 9-11, how that happened. No, nobody knows how Building 7 came down. Okay, we know 9-11 was a fraud. The American people don't know it, but more and more of them are believing it. Okay, so that was the first lie. Besides the inception, I'm not going back to the inception of the Federal Reserve, that original lie. But 9-11 was the first lie in this present state we're in. 9-11 is the kickoff of the war against the American people and the people of the world. 9-11 was a phony. It's a fraud. It didn't happen the way they told us it happened. Now, because of 9-11, we then had the authority to go into Afghanistan and Iraq. Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Okay, so that was the next lie. Now they're talking about going into Iran. Now, how would you feel if you were Iran and you had this big, powerful country, America, go into your next-door neighbor, take over, take over their oil fields, right? Wouldn't you be worried about what they were going to do to you? Of course you're going to be worried. But, uh, but the people of America don't think about it from Iran's point of view. They think about it from our point of view. So now we're going to send more troops into Iraq, and keep building up because they want Iraq and the Middle East to become part of the New World Order. And uh, Iraq was using, uh, Saddam wanted to start using euros instead of dollars, right? He was uh, messing up their, their whole consumption. Iran is, wants to start using euros instead of dollars. They are, they have. Okay? So I'm saying what they're trying to do is preserve their power. And one lie leads to the next lie, leads to the next lie. And until you get to the root cause of 9-11 which is supposedly the war on terror, will never solve our problems here. Should we send more troops into Iraq? Should we not send more troops into Iraq? Well, the truth is, 
The fact is that it all goes back to this war on terror. Where did 9-11 come from? That's the root cause of everything. And until we have a full investigation, find out why Building 7 fell down, why they shipped all the steel out of America so quickly, you know, from the buildings, why, why all the um, things that don't make any sense about 9-11, until we find out why it really happened, you know, we'll never understand why there's a war on terror. And we'll never be able to prove that the war on terror is a phony. You know, Nick and I discussed many things. One of the things we discussed, or he brought up in conversation, was reducing world population and felt that there were too many people in the world. In a way, I agree, there are too many people in the world, but I don't think I have the authority to say who's going to die and who's not going to die, you know. But they felt that uh, they wanted to reduce world population, and uh, he felt that it should be reduced by a half. He even mentioned to me once uh, that they, they were having a real problem trying to solve the Israel-Palestinian um, problem. And he talked to me once about uh, they were playing with the idea of bringing Israel to Arizona, you know, and taking all the people from Israel and giving everybody a million dollars and setting up Israel in the state of Arizona. Unbelievable. To, 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 end, that, to end that problem, because that, that, that's a problem that, they, that they're not in charge of, in a sense. They, they, they're not controlling that problem. They're very arrogant. They can do whatever they want to do. We have, and we, we've given these people the authority to create money out of thin air. And through that device, they control everything. And if you want to win the battle to stop that, you have to deny them the ability to create money. It's only because they can make money that they have all this power. They literally have the money machines. They, they have the money machines. They can print it. They can do whatever they want to do. They own everything. And we take over pretty quick. If we were the guys that issued the money, everybody had to come give us real assets for the use of this money we just printed up. You know, people, people uh, you know, I, I tell people, you know, uh, why in the world does the American government borrow money from the banks when they have the ability to create it themselves without borrowing it and paying interest on it? Why? And nobody can answer that question. Not one politician ever raises that. Why does the American government borrow money when they can create it without paying interest? Well, we did create it At, up until uh, 1913. 1913. And, and so people say, well, because if the American government does it, it'll create inflation. That's the answer. I say, well, let's look at it. The American government has the Federal Reserve do it, which creates the same inflation as if they did it. But also with the inflation, now you're getting massive debt. So with the Federal Reserve, you have inflation and debt. Now, if the American government made the money, backed by gold, which limited the amount they could make, you wouldn't have debt and you wouldn't have inflation. But, but inflation was only about 50% from the 1780s, I've looked it up, until the late 1800s. And then we have the central banks already trying to cause some panics, which they then used to push the Federal Reserve. And if we look at inflation since 1913 into 2007, uh, it's exponential. In fact, a dollar is worth about two pennies to what it was worth in 1913. Federal Reserve Chairman, former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan, doubled the money supply from 2000 to 2006. Uh, and then Edward Bernanke, the new Fed chief, came in and said he's going to double it again in the next two years. And then he said, oh, now I'm going to make the money supply numbers secret. And so now we don't even know. Right. Uh, but the evidence is they are just, I mean, in the curve of inflation, it gradually grows. And then suddenly at a point, it goes straight up. And it seems we've it's now... It's parabolic, been, yeah. Yeah, parabolic. But the, but the thing is that uh, the only thing I disagree with you on from... Uh, uh, early 1800 to 1913, there was no inflation other than during the Civil War. You know, when Lincoln was, was well, printing... Well, I'm talking about out. how much a dollar was worth. And I know. A dollar, a, a never changed. A dollar, there was no inflation. In that whole hundred years, there was no inflation. People knew what the money was worth. They could retire. They knew what it would cost them to live their lives out. There was no problem. It was only since 1913 when the Fed came in that we created massive inflation and massive debt. So then what you said earlier, then there really wasn't inflation. There was no inflation. So, so you don't get inflation when the government issues the money, at least in the U.S. history. Well, no, not, not, not if it's backed by gold. Well, uh, exactly. But I'm talking about, and I did look this up, um, and I believe that if, that if you look after the country was set up, 
and some of the things that happened with Andrew Jackson and, and the rest of it, there were points where spiked and, and there were manipulations. There were points, mostly during the Civil War. Yeah. And that's it? because uh, Lincoln printed so much money. Exactly, that. exactly. That's right. But once that ended, but basically there was no inflation other than, uh, other than that during that short period of time. I mean, a loaf of bread was a loaf. Of course, the same thing. People could plan their lives. Today, they, they, they plan the inflation. Now you have two parents working. Uh, they, can, they can't afford to, take, to, to pay for their family anymore. The kids are going to state-run schools now. The kids are being indoctrinated how to think. They're being given Ritalin. They're being given all these drugs. The whole country is being dumbed down. It's all because of the Federal Reserve System. And the Federal Reserve System and these bankers are responsible for the demise of America. And if we ever want to win this battle, you must shut down the Federal Reserve System. And we must shut down these bankers and restore sound money to this country. Will you talk a little bit about some of the families that own the private Federal Reserve, the stock in it? And, I mean, obviously, you say you're not a big expert on Bilderberg Group, but you talk about how it's the same system worldwide. It is the same families. They meet and kind of set the policy each year, and then it goes to the Royal Institute of International Affairs in England. It goes to the CFR in the U.S. And then these are their management bodies uh, where they wield control, uh, really the de facto Congresses uh, over the nation. So, uh, I mean, I would like to get you to speak some about the families that own and run the Federal Reserve, and if you can't connect it into these other international bodies. Well, I, I can't speak to those families, because the, 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 I can only speak about, you know, what I know for fact. I, 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 everything else is speculation, and I don't like to speculate. You know, I know about Rockefeller, because I, I was friends with him. We would talked about it, and I can tell you firsthand. What did Rockefeller tell you about the Federal Reserve and their family owning part of it? Well, uh, he said the New York Fed is the main controlling interest of the Federal Reserve System. They control the bulk of it. So the New York Fed is really the Federal Reserve System. Even though there's 12 different banks, it's run by the New York Fed. And the New York Fed is basically the Federal Reserve System. So who's ever running the New York Fed is where, and, and the families that control it, control the New York Fed. And they're, they're, they're the main uh, uh, engine behind the Federal Reserve System. And that's a wing of the Bank of England. Uh, well, the, well, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve are partners, you know, and the Bank of England is a private bank, and so is the Bundesbank in Germany, and the Bank of... All the, all the banks of the G8 countries are all private banks. They're private central banks. And look, what happened in Europe? Didn't Europe vote down uh, the European Constitution? Yes. They're still doing it. <laughs> Didn't they vote down the euro? They're still doing it. They don't care what the people vote. They do whatever they want to do. What we want doesn't matter anymore. It's their agenda. It's their plans that matter. Is it that prima facie evidence of a tyranny? Well, but there's no question we're in tyranny. There's no question we're living in a world where uh, uh, the American citizen is no longer a free individual human being to do the things that they wish to do. You know, we're, we're slaves, and, and, and it's getting worse. What do we got to do to bring these people down? Got you, in my opinion, uh, you must shut down the Federal Reserve System. And I think that um, there has to be an uprising. There has to be an uprising. People have to stand up. I, I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone, Alex. And uh, we need to get a majority of people, not a majority of people, but a... Uh, was 5% won the war against the British, a highly motivated group. But I agree, people have got to get angry first. I mean, not just, yeah, yeah, we know it's corrupt and that lack of discipline. We've got to get pissed. People don't seem to have the courage... To do what they have to do, you know. I want to say you've got a lot of courage. Well, thank you. You know, I don't know if I have a lot of courage. I just have. Well, a I want to thank you for what you're doing for my family. Oh, well, I have a sense of conscience and I have a sense of justice. You know, I, I get nervous about what I do, but I do it because there's no other choice. You know, I, I I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do it. You know, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, I've ostracized myself pretty much from Hollywood. You know, people are afraid to deal with me in Hollywood a lot because of what I do and the things I say. You know, I don't, I don't go along with routines. You know, a lot of people in Hollywood know the truth. They, they're not willing to stand up and speak about it. You know, and I know many of them have seen my movie, you know, and they know I'm right and they won't talk about it because everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid because the federal, they, they, they think that this money they get, these Federal Reserve notes, are really money and they think they have a comfortable lifestyle, and they're afraid to change. You know, they're afraid to stand up for what's right. And until people are willing to, to stand up and have the courage to do what they need to do, it's not going to change. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, what, you, what you're doing, what I'm doing, what other people like us are doing, 
can affect the change that people will stand up and say, hey, I've had enough. The thing is, we have one, we have one advantage. That they need us to cooperate. See, if we don't cooperate with them, they can't win. And so they always need our cooperation to go along with their programs. So they try to sell us. Right. They try to sell us. Democracy, this majority says this, believe in this, do this, do that. The, 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 the war on terror, you know, we've got to be scared. You know, they're always trying to do things to sell us so that will go along with them. And once we learn not to cooperate with them, then we win the game. And that's the point. Don't cooperate with them. Don't go along with the program anymore. Stop it. Join forces. You and I should run for president and vice president and take over this country and bring freedom back to this country. You know, that's what it's going to take. Two people like you and I, statesmen, who believe in freedom, who believe in Thomas Jefferson and the Constitution and the founding fathers to, to make this country whole again. Because right now it's in the grip of the evil ones, you know. And uh, the only way to stop that is for good men to stand up. Was Edmund Berg said, evil can only thrive when good men do nothing? Yes. Right? That, well, that we, we, we have, we've got to do something. That's what it is, you know. Uh, silence is golden, but when it comes to your freedom, it's yellow. You know, we have to stop being scared. We have to stand up and do what's necessary to take back, to stop these bankers, these elite, this government full of lies, congressmen full of liars, you know. People take, take destroying our borders, you know, creating a government. I mean, Im imagine this. You have, here you, have, you are in America, and they're combining America, Canada, and Mexico into one country, the North American Union, and the American people don't know anything about it. It's not even in the press. They'd rather talk about Rosie O'Donnell and Donald Trump calling each other names than discussing the fact that we're merging into one country. The press doesn't even report it. Or that Paris Hilton doesn't wear underwear. Yeah, Britney Spears. But, I mean, who cares? I mean, the fact of the matter happens to be that that tells you how controlled the media is. Here you are combining America, Canada, and Mexico into one country, and you don't see it in the press. Unless maybe it's Lou Dobbs. But you don't see it in the press. You just don't it see it. It should be the top score so, everywhere. Everywhere. And not a word about it, really. Why? That tells you there's the evidence that it's controlled. They don't want the American people to know what's going on. That's why they don't protect our borders. That's why we're losing our Constitution, the very document that secures our freedoms. There is a rising tide against them. There is a rising tide, but we have to mobilize. We have to mobilize. And we have to get all the good people in this country to stand together and say, I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, I think if you analyze the situation, and if you realize that since the Federal Reserve has come into being in 1913, illegally, without a constitutional amendment, by bribing a few senators during Christmas vacation, they turned over the most important power that the American government has, the creation and issuance of money, to a private bank. Through that private bank issuing money, they have destroyed this country. They have destroyed the purchasing power of the money in this country, They've created social programs that are destroying this country. Thanks to the work of Aaron Russo and Ron Paul and many others, folks are starting to find out who the real enemy is. Offshore private banking corporations that have engaged in a hostile corporate takeover of the United States and almost every other nation on the planet. And the private Federal Reserve is their beachhead here in the United States. Ron Paul has introduced H.R. 1207, that at time of taping has over 87 sponsors just to audit the private Federal Reserve that arrogantly says it's above all U.S. laws and above all three branches of government and that no law enforcement can investigate them. I mean, how asinine is that? How above the law is that? How ridiculous is that? Everybody else gets audited. Nobody else is above the law but them, this group of plutocrats, uh, this group of polycentric bankers that are setting up this neo-feudal world system. Now, they've taken over our government, both Republicans and Democrats. There's no difference anymore between the two parties. They control both parties. It doesn't matter to them which one wins, because who's ever running for president will be someone they anoint, okay? Whether it's Hillary Clinton or John McCain running for president next year, which they're going to be people that are going to do what they want them to do. And the fact of the matter happens to be that you can't win an election unless you have enough money to win. They make sure who gets the money. The most important point is they control both parties. And the public continues to only 
focus in on the distraction of the left puppet and the right puppet instead of looking at the puppet masters. In fact, more and more of this is coming out. Top Senate Democrats, bankers own the U.S. Congress. Senator Dick Durbin on Chicago radio station last week blurted out an obvious truth about Congress. This is from Salon, that despite being blindly obvious, it is rarely spoken. And quote, the banks, hard to believe, in a time when we're facing a banking crisis that many of the banks created are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill. And frankly, they own the place. So there is one of the most powerful Democrats in the country. Top Senate Democrat saying bankers own the U.S. Congress. It's true. Let's admit it. Let's stop debating the two puppets they put out in front of us. The liberal puppet, the conservative puppet. And then every time we wake up to one of the puppets, they just replace it with another puppet. Let's look past the puppets to the puppet master above them that's controlling the puppets. That's all Aaron Russo and myself and Ron Paul and so many other people are saying. Let's get back to a culture of liberty versus tyranny, not this left-right diversion. You know, when folks are sick of Obama in four to eight years, they're going to put a Republican in. And they'll put out different rhetoric but carry out the same operation because as— the top Senate Democrats said the bankers own the place, even though they engineered the crisis. And make no mistake, they did engineer it by design. Their own documents, their own IMF and World Bank documents admit that. And out of this crisis, they're setting up the new bank of the world, according to Time Magazine and Newsweek and the Wall Street Journal and just, just hundreds of publications with headlines like, and now for world government and the Financial Times of London. They create the crisis and then say, okay, our Ponzi scheme's falling apart and bankrupting you. Give us $12.8 trillion in the first six months of the banker bailout. And now they say, we'll set up a bank of the world you pay your carbon taxes to, and private bankers will rule your life, and we'll pay private greenhouse gas carbon taxes to two firms owned by Al Gore, and this is publicly admitted. I mean, this is how bad the scamming is getting. And we've got to wake up. We've got to say no. We've got to get angry and get in the face of the new world order. Again, the private offshore bankers own America. They own both parties. But they get you in a rah-rah, Coke versus Pepsi, Redskins versus Cowboys, you know, fight. And you get in this little political fight as followers instead of looking past that to the actual global elite and what they're setting up. So through that... Through these bankers attempting to t taking over America, knowing that America was the freest nation in the world, it was necessary for them to take over America, take away our gun rights of, of uh, freedom to bear arms, and create a country where we, where we become slaves. Because once they take over America, the rest of the world becomes a lot easier for them. And so by creating 9-11, by creating an event to terrify the American people, that were being attacked by terrorists. You create a, a, a world where there's a, an enemy that can never be pinpointed. You can never win the battle. It's a hundred year war. It's a never ending war on terrorism, right? So you're always fighting this war. And through the war on terrorism, which is the first, the 9 11, which is the first lie, then you create the war on terrorism, which is the next lie, then you create the war on Iraq for weapons of mass destruction, which is the next lie, and it's one lie to the next lie to the next lie, now it's going to be the Iran, the next lie, sending more troops in the surge into, into uh, Iraq. Think about what Aaron Russo is saying here. The war on terror is a war on the American people and the people of the world. You see, the elites always sell the public on tyranny by attacking a minority that's unliked first, or the outsider. Oh, we're just getting rid of the Bill of Rights and Constitution and having secret arrest and FEMA camps and the Military Commissions Act for foreigners. It's just for them. And now the federal government has been caught saying that gun owners, conservatives, people buying ammunition, they've been caught saying that returning veterans are the number one threat to homeland security. And in a way, that's true. People that know about the Bill of Rights and Constitution and know that our country is being taken over and hijacked by foreign banks, I guess they are the threat to the criminals that have done this. That's all the New World Order is, is a private corporate takeover of the nation states, of the governments of the world. And then these private corporations bring in a tyrannical form of neo-feudalism that they call corporatism or fascism. Mussolini said that 
fascism should properly be called corporatism. And that's what it is. And they create the socialism to get control of the wealth and to control society. And then they pipe the profits to themselves. So they socialize the general public to get control of us, but it's private above us. It's basically just slavery. Now, think about what Aaron Russo was saying here, and it's absolutely true. Th this is a war on the American people. They build homeland security. They build the police state in the name of fighting foreign enemies, and then they flip it all around to use it against the American people and the MIAC reports and the DHS reports and the rest of it. This whole thing was set up for the people, and Aaron Russo nailed it. It's just one thing leading to the other, and it's always with the event. With, it's always in the point of taking over more countries, more more dominance. You know, making sure the American dollar, making sure the G8 stays in control of everything, and what they want to do, uh, and is to control the American people, control the people of the world, put RFID chips in everybody, so everybody's a slave to these central banks. Did you ever talk to Nick Rockefeller after he told you all this? And then 9-11 took place? No. 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 But he did, I told you, he told me that you're going to see men running around caves looking for Osama bin Laden. You know, you're going to see men looking for, you know, these guys. And they're going to be, you know. They told you it was all going to be bull. It was a phony. The whole thing is a fake. It's a fraud. Was he laughing or was he just coldly saying this? No, it was more laughing. Cynical. Laughing. You know, it was more like. Look how stupid everybody is. Look how stupid everybody is. We can do whatever we want to do. Well, it is ridiculous. It's like with Al Zakari. They claim they killed him like 14 <laughs> times. And then they never said, well, we didn't kill him last time, but we killed him this time. They never even, ch now they're like practicing being ridiculous. Well, what about bin Laden being in the American hospital, getting kidney, getting kidney help, Yeah. right, in the American hospital, yeah. right? They, they could, if they wanted Osama bin Laden, they could have gotten him. Oh, yeah. He was right in the American high after the coal. Well, every time our troops really would keep catching Taliban leaders, they would be ordered by the generals to let them go. That's come out in the newspapers, the only area there. And they kept going, what's, and then Pat Tillman was complaining about it, and then he got shot. I've talked to his brother. Oh, and, you did? Uh, and then he got shot, and there was a big hero charging Al-Qaeda. No Al-Qaeda, he just, somebody shot him in the back. Look, we're dealing with complete evil. We're dealing with complete evil. And until the American people wake up, and say, we don't want the evil in our country anymore, and we want to come back to a country of decency and goodness and integrity and honor. You know, we're, we're going down that road, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take people to stand up and say, we don't want to live in this kind of a world anymore. You know, I believe we should pull all our troops out of Iraq. I believe we should leave other countries alone, let other countries live their lives the way they choose to. You know, stop trying to spread democracy around the world, which is the worst form of government there is anyway. Restore our, re restore our republic to what it's supposed to be and, 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 and go back to what the founding fathers gave us and uh, try and restore that, restore the republic. Look, the point, the point of everything is that we have to mobilize, each one of us. You and I can't do everything, Alex. You and I may be leaders. We may be, we may be out there and people listen to us so we have to say and follow us. But the truth of the matter happens to be it takes all Americans to stand together, to stand tall, to mobilize and say, we're not going to take this anymore. I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. We're going to stand up and, and, and fight the battle. And you and I can't do this alone. We're just leaders of the thing. But other people have to join in with us and stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and say, I'm not going to take it anymore. That's what it's going to take to win this effort and to stop cooperating with the government and with all their rules and regulations and to wake everybody up, to hand out DVDs of my movie, to hand out DVDs of your movie, to educate everybody to what's going on. Well, if, if, you, if you don't fight the corruption and you don't stand up for what's right in life, you can end up being a serf and a slave and you're leaving your children a world that you wouldn't want to live in yourself. So how, how can you, in decency, behave that way? You have to stand up for what's right in life. And unless you do that, you're nothing. Well, freedom and liberty is what, Amer is what people are, really want, you know. And it's time to stop the duplicity of the government from lying to us. You see, many, many people know the truth of what's happening in this country. They know the truth, like the numbers you gave about 9-11. But they're afraid to stand up. People have to find their courage and stand up and say, I'm not going to take this anymore. I know the truth, you know. And uh, it's like 
they create a situation where if you tell the truth, you, you're considered uh, a lunatic. You know, in other words, if, if someone goes on a TV show and says, 9-11 is inside job, oh, you're an idiot, you're crazy. They call you names. You can't be afraid of that. Well, it doesn't so the work truth anymore. Is, I mean, they have no facts. Just calling you crazy doesn't make you crazy. Well, we know that. They also go get kooks, who are kooks, to put them on and then say they represent us. That's right, exactly. Another tactic. Exactly, exactly. And Bill O'Reilly is great at that. Sean Hannay is great at that. They just put people on who they can dominate, you know. But Why do you think guys like that, they're not stupid. I mean, I've taught people that know They know the truth. Why do you think they decide to join the evil? I, I, that has to be in their hearts. I mean, I had the opportunity to do that, and then in my heart, I couldn't do it. So it has but, I mean, how could you or I consciously be involved in something like putting AIDS virus in black Africans' vaccines? I mean, what the hell? I mean, it, it's like... We're not good guys either. I mean, I don't think I'm like some special, perfect person. What, what the hell is wrong with this elite? I mean, what are they running around doing evil? I mean, they just run around continually doing evil. Well, I, I, think, I think a lot of them think they're doing the right thing. I think a lot of them think they're doing the right thing. Not, not the top elite, but people within the system, you know. But I think that uh, it's, all, it's all about, uh, as Nick said to me, it's about control and power. They have all the money they want. They can make all the money they want. They, they have a machine that can make all the money. <laughs> it's not about money. It's about control. It's about their vision of how they want to see the world in their eyes. And, um, you know, you and I believe in individuality, in the person being the dominant thing, the individual being the dominant person. Today we live in a world where institutions are dominant, not people. You know, the American, you know, we the people by the people for the people. Now it's we the institutions, by the institutions, for the institutions. People are secondary. It's all about corporations and institutions. And the Federal Reserve is the biggest institution in the world. You know, if you ask somebody what's the biggest corporation in the world, they'll say uh, Google or Walmart or Exxon or something. But the biggest corporation in the world is the Federal Reserve System, right? And all the other corporations feed off the nipple of the Federal Reserve System. Well, it's like the Monopoly game. Uh, the bank always wins. It has unlimited money. It's not the people playing on the board. Exactly. The bank owns the board, the box, the, right. the and shelf it's sitting on. So, so but that's because you gave them the ability to make the money. You have to take that away from them. Well, you take the bank away from the private bankers. Exactly. You have to take the creation of money away from the private bankers, and you'll solve 95% of your problems. Well, let me look at America. 10% growth rates every year like China's having right now. The U.S. had 10% growth rates until the Federal Reserve took over. And then if you look at that, it all starts really going downhill from there. And, and well, they destroyed the American worker. They, what they've done, here's what's happened. The, the Federal Reserve has created this massive inflation in America, which means that the American worker has to keep making more money to keep up uh, uh, with the cost of living. The more money they make to keep up with the cost of living, the less competitive they become in the world economy. So now what happens is we have to pay our workers so much to keep up the cost of living, saying, well, screw the American worker. Let's go overseas now and get the cheap labor. But really, that's and a war being waged against the middle class. Of course The bankers is. print the money. The, I mean, really, this is a war being waged against the middle class. The bankers print the money. Everything they're doing is about destroying any private pools of wealth or independence. Yeah, but, the, but, the, but the, what I'm trying to say is because of the inflation that they've created... They've now allowed other countries to outcompete us. You see, because other countries don't have to pay as much money as we have to pay here to our workers to survive. Yes. So now we're not competitive anymore. So we've lost our manufacturing base. We've lost our competitive. In the, in the old days, the American worker, you wanted to buy everything American. You wouldn't buy anything from Japan. This was cheap crap. And what does that leave us? It leaves America this military force. And so the elites giving us a deal. We'll continue to build up your military and give you homeland security jobs, shift your economy over to being the bulldog enforcer of the New World Order. Exactly. You can either do, and, and by controlling the economy, they force everybody into that position. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. And we, 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 there's no more manufacturing here. We're a service economy. We do nothing. We provide nothing. We provide nothing to the rest of the world anymore. Well, first of all, Freedom to Fascism is a movie that everybody should see. Because we, 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 we show the fraud of the uh, income tax, 
We show how judges put people in jail for no reason. We, we show the corruption of the justice system. And we show how the Federal Reserve came into being and how it's controlling society. And, uh, the new, and how the, all the uh, central banks of the world are working together through the Bank of International Settlements in, in uh, Switzerland, uh, which is the central bank for all the central banks, and how they all work together to create this one world government, the one world order, which is what they're trying to do. So uh, Freedom to Fascism is a movie just to get you a good basic education about how the world is really working. And I really want everybody to see that movie. Critical. In terms of the uh, CFR, in terms of compartmentalization, I mean, there are many good people, I believe, that are part of these organizations who don't even understand what the organization's really about. People like, like when I was in Germany doing cancer treatment, uh, there was a gentleman there who was a, uh, visiting a friend of his who had cancer. And he was a member of the CFR. And uh, we were talking. And uh, I showed him the movie. He said, oh, my God, I'm going to resign. I had no idea this was what, this, what the CFR was about. He had no idea. He was just a nice guy who thought he was in this prestigious organization. Yeah, a lot of it's about getting good people and, and so you can watch them. Keep your friends close, your enemies close. Well, no, that no, wasn't even that. It was well, a lot of people join the CFR because they think it's a prestigious organization. It'll, it'll help them in business, make good business contacts. They don't. They didn't have an understanding that the CFR is really about world domination, about uh, you know how they and the Trilateral uh, Commission, the Bilderbergers, all work together, you know, with the banks to control the people. They don't. A lot of them don't understand that. They don't see the big picture. Oh, it's CFR, it's a prestigious organization. I'll make this one, I'll make that one. I can do good business deals out of it. It's just business to them. The CFR wants to get the people in there that have influence and power, you know, and uh, uh, so they're part of that. So they're, not, they're not opposing them, you know. It's like the, 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 whole, the whole country today is becoming the haves and have-nots. You're getting, you're getting the very, very wealthy, the middle class is being destroyed, and you're getting the poor people. Isn't this just a slick mafia that took over and, and, and uses fancy PR? Well, my, you, can, you can call it mafia, you can call it whatever you want, but it's, it's definitely a criminal organization. There's no question about it. But it's a criminal organization that has prestige, you know, that, has, that, that, that appears to have, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, class. Class, style. You know, it's like, you know, respected. It's respected. People don't look at it as being a criminal organization. That's what a great job they've done. You know, people look at Alan Greenspan as being a hero. You know, the maestro, you know. What do you think happened with him in the, in the late 60s? He wrote a big section, a chapter for Ayn Rand uh, in a book, and he talked about how horrible the Federal Reserve was. We needed a gold standard. Now the bankers are robbing us. And then they literally came and said, oh, and you see somebody who, who, who made a deal with Beelzebub. Well, you know, exactly. You make a deal with the devil. I mean, it gave him a chance to, uh, to be one of the most powerful men on the earth, you know, and it gave him a chance to accomplish things he never thought he would accomplish in his life other than that. And it's very seductive. You know, it's a very attractive perfume. I mean, I was attracted when they came to me and spoke to me about it. I thought about it. I was attracted to it, you know. They asked me if I wanted to open up these nightclubs, you know, open up a chain of Baywatch nightclubs, you know, and we'll do this thing, we'll do that, and we can do this. I mean, I mean, all these things were proposed to me, to business ventures. But I, I, I you know, I, I... You know what it is? It was your nature, though. You, it just, it's the way you are. You, you couldn't take the deal. Well, I, I can't do that to people. I, I, don't, I, I just can't be in a position where I can do that to other people. I just I have a conscience, and my conscience would not permit me to do that. You know, people say I'm very courageous. I don't think I'm courageous. I think I have a conscience. And uh, my conscience doesn't allow me to, take a, to do that to people. I just, it makes me feel sick. You know, I, I just don't believe in it. No, I agree. When I do bad things, I feel bad. When I do good things, I feel good. Yeah, exactly. And I feel the same way. And, and uh, I mean, I don't know what's going to come out of it. I mean, I don't it. have that much money, but I've got some money. I mean, it's like, what more do I need? I can go on a trip if I want. I can help you know, pay for my kids to go to school and be... Have my wife, you know, comfortable. I mean, how do I go out and screw people so I can have some more junk? Well, um, you, you know, money, money, money's a funny thing. You know, I, I was talking to uh, Michael Eisner one day, and I said to Michael, you know, you know, you may have a billion dollars, Michael, but they're all dollars. You know, <laughs> you know, if the dollar goes bad, what, what, how much money are you going to have? 
you know. And that's the th- and that's the thing, you know. You, you know, everything is denominated in dollars. Everybody thinks in terms of dollars, but the dollar has no value. And then someday it's, it's you know everything returns to the mean. Well, really, the whole universe, financial universe we live in, is a matrix fraud. Yes, it is, and that's why it's going to come crashing at some point. And they're going to try and hold it up as long as they can. I mean, whenever they want to manipulate the markets, they can. If they want to send the price to go down lower, they can. If they want to send the stock market up, they can. They do that. There's no more free markets. You don't live in a you don't live in a society where free markets rule anymore. You don't live in a capitalistic society. You know, but meanwhile, they say it's capitalistic right. and free market all day when really they're waging war financially and politically. Exactly right. Aaron Russo, I want to thank you for this interview. Anything else you want to add? No, I'm happy, I'm happy to do, do it for you. I'm How about your website? Me. My website, freedomtofascism.com. Go over there, take a look at it. You know, But just, folks, you know, all I can say is you know, take our country back. Restore the Constitution. Don't let these bankers do this to us anymore. Stand up. Don't be afraid of them. And uh, do what you got to do, you know. And um, I have plans in the works. And uh, when I get over my my uh, problems, you know, I will will reveal them, you know. And well, I'll uh, be supportive of that. Thank you, Alex. And listen, you've done a great job alerting people to the truth. And um, don't 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 in other words, don't be afraid to be ridiculed by these people. You know, if 9-11 was a phony, and I know it was, then stand up and say it's a phony. Don't be, don't be scared to tell the truth. Don't allow their, um, you know, their, their powers of um, trying to make you look silly uh, to frighten you. What did you think of what Charlie Sheen did? I love what Charlie Sheen did. I was so uh, respectful of what he did. I, was, I, want, I, I just applauded him. People but, saw no. right through that attack. They, like, they flipped the light switch when they went after him. Yeah, but you see, but they don't, you see the thing is, that more people don't come out and do it. You know, to build that wave. Charlie did it. I'm really proud of the guy. David Lynch did. But, they, but the media was smart and didn't bite this time. The, right. I mean, a few people have, but they're not picking up on it because they control the media. Brolin, James Brolin did on The View. I heard that. I heard that as well. But again, they're not picking Barbara up Walters on it. Barbara Walters looked like she was about to have a heart attack. But, not, but they don't pick up on it, you see. They, 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 don't, they don't allow it to go anywhere. You know, it comes if someone says something, they let it die. You know, but they keep perpetuating. You know, the war on terrorism. They keep perpetuating all these things that are lies. And uh, because we've given the Federal Reserve the money, making power, they control the media, they control the government, and they're all in bed together. So we, we, you're fighting all this propaganda all the time, and it's a very difficult fight. Americans, mobilize, stand together, stand tall. Tell the government you're mad as hell. No longer cooperate with the government. Do not accept the national ID card. Do everything in your power to restore freedom and your individuality back to America. Stop being a country run by the institutions for the institutions. Let's go back to we the people, by the people, for the people, as opposed to we the institution, by the institution, for the institution. Stand up for your individual rights. Stand up for the godliness that's in each and every one of us. Thank you for watching this historic interview with Aaron Russo. Please don't just stand down after watching this film. Research the private Federal Reserve for yourself. Realize it is the main head on the Hydra that we have to go after. Realize that we can fight the political parties all day, but until we go after the heart, the root of the problem, nothing's going to get better. We have this ruling class of private bankers that issue all this fiat currency, and they have committed unbelievable crimes and have the audacity to claim that they're above the law. Ladies and gentlemen, now more than ever, we don't have a choice. It's us or them. Either the new world order is removed from power, or the world faces more wars, more tyranny, and a nightmarish police state carried out by these eugenicists. So in the memory of Aaron Russo and every other freedom lover out there in history, and for the future of our children and the species, humanity itself, let's call for grand jury investigations of the private Federal Reserve. Let's arrest the bankers. Let's kick these foreign corporate criminals out of our country and get our constitutional republic back. Let's stop being distracted and diverted by the liberal and conservative puppets they stick up in our faces on television. Let's look past the front men to the actual architects of the new world order and bring them to justice. 
There's no way these arrogant bastards can get away with this if we expose them and speak out against them. And more and more, it's coming out, even in the mainstream media, that they are a pack of criminals who are above the law and who have hijacked our nation. But they're only above the law in our minds. We have to expose them as the criminals they are and bring them to justice. Look in the mirror. You are the solution. Take action and join the ranks of folks like Aaron Russo, Ron Paul, and so many others. God bless you all, and thank you for watching this presentation. Now spread the word about the true enemy of the people in the Fed, in the New World Order, in the hegemony of private central bankers. It is a big idea, a new world order. In the near future, Earth is dominated by a powerful world government. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? For thousands of years, their dark order grew. Now, as they hail the birth of the new world order, their great dream of exterminating 80% of humanity is at hand. For the first time in history, the elite's plan for world government is blown wide open. You will learn the secret that drives the entire New World Order agenda. Bilderberg is making great progress toward a world government, and only an educated, informed public can stop them in their tracks. Alex. For the first time, all the pieces have been put together. The dots have been connected, and the picture is crystal clear. Earth's ruling elite believe they have discovered the fountain of youth. But before they can attain it, 80% of us must die. A psychopathic technocracy is establishing world government so there can be no escape from their plan. The New World Order is the Old World Order. I mean, it's just the names have changed, the appearances have changed. Most people have no idea. They're not after money. They have all the money they need. They're after power. That's their aphrodisiac. I was pulled out of the plane in Munich. They interrogated me four hours. Some shots were fired. I need you to move off the problem. Their great dream of exterminating 80% of humanity is at hand. Endgame. Blueprint for global enslavement. You have been warned. Obama is notoriously a liar. We need to go to where the real architecture of government is and it's not in a president wall street has hijacked washington in broad daylight well obama's already fudging he's yeah. fudged since day one in this election the elite are using obama to pacify the public so they can usher in the north american union by stealth launch a new Cold War, and continue the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. The globalists are outside all the nations. That gives them safety, and they play countries off against each other. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. What they're doing is using the existence of the United States to act out their Wall Street fantasies of world domination and maintaining their capital structures and maintaining their system of looting. The fight that this country has been waging since its inception 
is for the central bankers not to take over the country. President Barack Obama is only the tool of a larger agenda. Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. Presidential candidate Barack Obama was publicly criticizing the North American Free Trade Agreement in a bid for votes, but privately telling Canadian officials not to worry about it. If you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military force. What do you call this thing where you get this false sense of gratification, but because a black man is in office, everything's going to be all right? No, everything's not going to be all right. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now, especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. The Obama deception. The truth strikes back. Get your copy of the Obama deception today at Infowars.com or download it in super high quality at PrisonPlanet.tv. You rolling? What happened on 9-11 is a phony, you know, and we've never learned the truth about 9-11. The whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be in those chips. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib. They do whatever they want to do. What we want doesn't matter anymore. It's their agenda, it's their plans that matter. They have all the money they want. They can make all the money they want. They, they have a machine that can make all the money. <laughs> it's not about money. It's about control. It's about their vision of how they want to see the world. You hear George Bush saying democracy means freedom. No. Democracy equals new world order. I believe God put me on this earth to be the best person I could be. I put everybody on this earth to be the best they can be. You have to stand up for what's right in life. And unless you do that, you're nothing. Award-winning filmmaker turned freedom fighter, Aaron Russo was an amazing individual. You know, he'd been battling cancer for more than three and a half years when he began making America Freedom to Fascism that he shot, directed, edited pretty much on his own with just the help of a few people. An amazing individual. A long life of award-winning films, of hard work, and for standing up for the Bill of Rights and Constitution. You know, when we first went and shot this interview, I put it on the web for free. Uh, but parts of it have never been seen. So here today, you're going to have a chance to see the in-depth interview, the final interview with Aaron Russo. But his important work lives on. You know, he made one of the definitive films exposing the elite that control this nation and the world, the private Federal Reserve. And the information he put out two years ago rings more true today than ever. And uh, his film, America, Freedom to Fascism, and Mad as Hell, and the other great works he did, just continue like ripples in a pond uh, to light bushfires in the minds of men and women everywhere. So this film is dedicated to the one, the only, Aaron Russo. You rolling? I'm honored to be interviewed by Alex Jones, a truth seeker, fighting for justice in America. Now he's charming me. He's getting me all smiling. <laughs> Aaron, when did you start to think something was wrong in the world or start to find out about the whole banking cartel and the Federal Reserve System, but the new world order? Well, that, that was a, a progression of events. Uh, I became very, I'm, I've always been a very independent person, always believed in individuality, and that we were put on this earth to be... Uh, and I began managing her. And as soon as I started managing her, her career took off like a rocket. You know, it was just for, fortuitous, I guess. And um, uh, we became very, very successful. And through managing Bet, I started producing shows on Broadway where I won the Tony, and I produced a television show where I won the Emmy with Dustin Hoffman and Bet, you know. And then uh, I produced The Rose for her, where she got Academy Award nominations. And then that led me to producing Trading Places, which everybody knows, you know. I think it's the best Eddie Murphy movie. Well, it's a good one. I don't know if it's the best, but it's a really good one. And I'm very proud I made that movie. 
And so in, in, in my mind, um, I feel as if I've made a classic comedy in Trading Places, a classic musical in The Rose, and a classic documentary in Freedom to Fascism. You know, so I'm very proud of my work that I've done as a filmmaker. Aaron, why do you do this? What's the philosophy of your life? What do you think life's all about? I think the importance of life is to like yourself. If you don't like yourself, nothing means anything. To like yourself means you have to respect yourself. To respect yourself means you have to take actions that you respect if somebody else did them. And what's the point of living if you don't like who you are? You can have all the money in the world, and if you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see there, what's the point of it? So I, to me, the most important thing is that I like who I am and that I take actions that I would respect if somebody else did them. That you live a life of character, honesty, truthfulness. And I believe that a person has the ability to mold their character like a sculptor can mold a piece of clay. You know, there's no saying that a leopard never changed its spots. I don't believe that. I believe people have the total ability to mold their character into what they choose to be in their life, what their ideals are. And that's what I try to do with my life. I am not the same person today I was as I was 30 years ago. I've changed a lot because I wanted to be something better than what I was before. And my philosophy is that you have to like yourself, you have to be a decent person with character and integrity and honor. And that's what's important. Back in, uh, in the late 80s, I was a pretty big silver trader and gold trader. And uh, I don't think I've ever told this story on tape before. Uh, I was a pretty big silver and gold trader, and um, the uh, I took and I always paid my taxes, and I took what was a legal tax deduction on my silver trades, and uh, a few years later, I think it was '88 or '89 or something, the uh, IRS claimed that what I did and other people did as well was now illegal. We couldn't do it anymore, but they made it retroactive. I said, what do you mean retroactive? It was legal then. We did, I did what was legal. He said, yeah, but it's now we're making it illegal retroactively. And you, it's, that's not good. So you owe us six hundred dollars or $800,000. For what? It was legal. How could you make something retroactive? Change the law backwards in time. It makes no sense. Well, we're doing it. And so everybody said they can't do that. So we went to court, a class action lawsuit. And the judge agreed with the IRS and said so they could do it retroactively. And that's when I knew that there was something wrong in America with the IRS and the system here, you hey, know. Aaron, you were telling me this story last night, uh, and before you even finished saying, in the late 80s, the tax law, I said retroactive. And I knew that because they literally ruined my dad, but, but he paid. He, he didn't know. He still thought this was America. And uh, it, it was legal tax law, what you're supposed to do. They said retroactively you owe, and with, not just retroactive, but they said you also have penalties and interest. That's right. So how do you have penalties and interest on something when they retroactively change the law? Well, first of all, they can't retroactively be, how can you, how can you do anything retroactively? Penalties and interest are a farce. The whole thing, because they do whatever they want to do. And that's when I realized America is not America. It's not the land that I was taught it was. Because they can do whatever they wish to do. And there's nothing the citizen can do about it. Now, you've made America Freedom to Fascism. I want to walk through that film, and I want to encourage everybody out there to, to uh, get a copy of it on DVD. It was also in theaters around the country, and the, I think the best film out there on the Federal Reserve and the IRS and the whole banker scam, and I want to discuss that with you here. Uh, but I wanted to uh, go back a little bit uh, to the point that we discussed uh, last night where you don't advise people to not pay. And I do the same thing. People say, well, wait, you're saying it's a scam, but you're saying go ahead and pay it. And I like the way you summed it up. Well, it's really fairly simple. I mean, uh, since making that movie, you know, many people come to me and ask me whether they should pay their income taxes or not, you know, and I never advise people not to pay. And the reason I, I tell them, I said, look, I've done a lot of research. There isn't, the Supreme Court has ruled that the IRS has no authority. The 16th Amendment did not give the IRS the authority to tax your labor and your wages. That's a fact. All right? The Supreme Court is the law of the land, you know, and, and, the, and the IRS does not trump the Supreme Court. However, that being the case, the fact is if the mafia would come to you and say, we want $2,000 a month that we're going to hurt you, I would not advise you not to pay them because you may get hurt by not paying them. 
whether it's legal or not, doesn't necessarily matter. You're going to get hurt if you don't. It's the same thing with the IRS. They can hurt you. They can put you in jail. They can torture you. So if you don't pay them, you may get hurt. So I never advise people not to pay. You know, I tell people, yeah, pay your taxes. Look what happened to but, Congressman Hansen. Yeah, Congressman Hansen's a great example. Pay your taxes. But you know what? Shut down the Federal Reserve System, and eventually you won't have to pay those taxes anymore. See, the next day, you know, there was my picture in the newspapers, the headlines, electric theater short-circuited, it was raided. And in the article, uh, they went ahead and they said that uh, the reason they raided the club was because the fire department came there and saw it was messy full of garbage, and the hippies started attacking them, which was totally not true. Those yeah. dirty hippies. It was, yeah, it was totally false. You know, it was, it was a complete fabrication. So they ran a false flag on you. They yeah. you. Yeah, they, of course. You know, and uh, I was in shock. I said, people lie like that? People actually do these things? I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, it was an awakening to me. And I went on television. I told people on television that they lied. Nobody cared. Nobody cared what the truth was. You know, it was shocking to me. Um, and then a, 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 week or, a week or two weeks later, I forget exactly what it was, uh, two, two cops come to see me, a lieutenant and a, and a sergeant, a uh, captain and a sergeant. And they said, Mr. Russo, we're sorry if you got hurt that night at the club and the raid, but uh, we're here to tell you that if you want to keep the club open, it's going to take uh, $2,000 a month. And we're going to come see you once a month. And whenever we have to raid you, we're going to call you, you know, and we'll let you know we're going to come in tonight and raid you. This was mafia. Uh -huh. Well, the police mafia, yeah. you know. And uh, actually, it was actually actually more interesting that they said, listen, there's the A plan, there's the B plan, and there's the super deluxe plan. And this one will cost you, each one will cost you that much money a month. Which one do you want? What was I, the super deluxe? That's the one I took. That was a 2000 a month plan. And I took that plan, and... Um, I paid them $2,000 a month, and they left me alone. And whenever they were going to raid the club, they would come there. We're going to raid. We're going to have a phony raid tonight, you know, just to look good for the people in the neighborhood, you know. So that was your first big education? That was my education into corruption in government, you know. But I really thought that was basically Chicago. I didn't realize it was the whole country was like that. And so that was my wake-up call, that people lie and cheat and steal. And uh, I thought everybody was always honest and nice and decent, and uh, I had no idea about any of these things. Well, what happened with me was that they, finally one day they came to me, and they said, look, we, we, we can't take your money anymore. I said, why, what's up? What's going on? I said, we have to close your club. There's elections coming, and the aldermen and the neighbor don't want you open anymore, so we can't take your money. So I had to go to court and fight them, and they were trying to close the club. And then one night there was a fire, and the club never reopened again. It was, they, the club just closed, and... That was the end of the club, and they, they, they burned me down. And that, that was the end of my experience. And then I moved back to New York, where I met Bette Midler, and uh, I uh, ran into her at a little uh, nightclub she was playing called The Improv, and I thought she was fabulous, and through a series of events, unique individuals to fulfill our God-given potential, and that uh, the only way to fulfill your potential is to be free, to find out who you are, and to make your errors, to make mistakes. And as I... As, uh, I grew up, I began to realize more and more the government was inhibiting me in things that I wanted to do. And uh, what happened, uh, I was very successful in the ladies' lingerie business. I worked for my dad. He had a small undergarment business. And I created the first ladies' bikini panties back in 1963, actually. And then I opened up a, um, a nightclub in Chicago called the Electric Theater. Uh, that, that opened up the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. Wow. All right? And so the city of Chicago was in flames the day my club opened, and nobody came out to the club. And um, well, what happened was that um, uh, that was the year of the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 68. And so my club became a hangout for the hippies, you know, because they, they wanted to go to Chicago and protest what was going on. And I was having a concert at my club one night to raise money. And uh, the police uh, raided the nightclub, my club for no reason at all. And uh, I was standing outside my, in my office looking, overlooking the street. And I saw all these paddy wagons pulling up in front of my club. And I was a 24-year-old kid. 
you know, I had no experience at all, really. So what are these paddy wagons doing here? And then I saw all these cops getting out of the paddy wagons coming into my club. I said, oh my God, they're raiding me. And so uh, I ran down to the stage and I got on the stage and I stopped the band from playing. And I said to the people in the audience, we're being raided, you know, so uh, sit down on the floor, cooperate, you know, you know, and uh, uh, pull out your identification and cooperate with the police. And as I said that, uh, two of the cops from behind threw me onto the floor and grabbed me and, and started dragging me out of the club. Uh, and uh, I'm going, you know, victory, victory, you know, I'm playing it for all it was worth at the time. I was a kid. And, uh, uh, and then I saw the fire department there, and the fire department was dumping garbage cans, the garbage all over the floor. And I thought to myself, well, why are they doing that? You know, very quickly as, I was dra- as they were dragging me out. And I didn't quite understand it. So they threw me into the paddy wagon. As I got into the paddy wagon, one of the cops grabbed my testicles from behind and squeezed. And I went into the paddy wagon in gigantic pain. And uh, the next person that came into the paddy wagon, the cop, as he was stepping in, the cops took the billy club, smashed him on the head with it, and just split his skull, you know, for no reason. I mean, there was nothing wrong. So that was kind of your awakening. That was my awakening. Like, what is going on? I thought this was America. So I, I initially blamed it on Chicago and Mayor Daly. Think it was just it was, it was Chicago. And anyway, I went on the I went. It was the headlines of the newspapers.